So I, I am a scholar of comparative politics. I study democracy uh, throughout the world and, and through history, but I'm going to use my talk today to use a, that comparative lens that I normally use to look at other democracies to look at my own country, the United States. I do this not because, uh, because the United States is an important country. What happens in the US, of course, matters a great deal, but also I think there are some broader lessons uh, from the US experience for Europe and for other democracies. So I'm going to begin uh, uh, this evening, though, with some data, some numbers. The International Organization Freedom House every year produces a global freedom index. It assigns, democ assigns a democracy score to every country in the world uh, with a low score of zero, a high score of 100. A decade ago, the United States received a score of 94 out of 100, which put it on par with Great Britain, Canada, Germany. And this is really where the US has sat for many decades. But today, the US is freedom, so 94. Today, the US's Freedom House score is 83, which is tied with Romania and Mongolia and two points below Argentina. So this, this may come as shocking news, but when you, have a, when you have government efforts to restrict voting rights, when you have violent threats against election workers, election officials, and when you have a president who's unwilling to leave office after an election, you reach a point where Freedom House gives you a, the same score as a score lower than Argentina. So this, this drop in the Freedom House score uh, between 2016 and 2021 means that the American political system has experienced what political scientists call democratic backsliding. And to be clear, it's not a severe case of democratic backsliding, not, nothing like what we've seen, for instance, in Hungary or Turkey uh, over the last decade. But all major international democratic indices register a pretty significant decline in the US score after 2016. So the question that occupies me and that I think we should all think about is what in the world has gone wrong? How has this happened? Now, this, is, this puzzle in a sense is, is exacerbated when we think about from a social scientific point of view, it's really quite surprising that this has happened. Social scientists uh, disagree about a lot of things, but there's two pretty rock solid findings that political scientists, economists who study these issues can agree on. First of all, rich democracies never die. No country in the past century with a GDP per capita above $17,000 has ever experienced a democratic breakdown. The US, of course, is four times that level. The second seemingly rock solid finding is that old democracies never die. No democracy over the age of 50 has ever broken down. So even if we date American democracy as beginning in 1965, which is, I think, an accurate way of coding American democracy because this is when voting rights came to all Americans, the US uh, American democracy after 2016 was over 50 years old. So in this sense, the, the crisis that's facing America, the, this, this genuine episode of democratic backsliding represents a puzzle. Unique among its peer countries, the rich old democracies, for instance, of Western Europe, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, Scandinavia, East Asia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, unique among this cluster of countries, only the US experienced democratic backsliding. So why? I'm going to offer uh, an answer, and I'll draw upon my recent book, Tyranny of the Minority, with Stephen uh, Levitsky. So what, what has brought America to the breaking point, and what are some lessons that we can draw from this? So broadly speaking, our book focuses on two culprits. One is the radicalization of one of America's political parties, the Republican Party. And second, and maybe more interesting, I think, uh, for Sw Swiss and for Europeans generally, is a set of political institutions that are making this problem worse. So I'm going to talk about each of those factors in turn, and in the end, I'll come back to think about what are some broader lessons of this. The first major challenge facing American democracy today is an authoritarian turn within one of our two old parties. A democracy can't survive for long if one of its major parties is not committed to playing by democratic rules. So I want to be really clear about what I mean by being committed to democracy, because this is, of course, a serious charge to make about one of the major parties. So in our book, we draw upon the great scholarship of the political scientist Juan Linz, a Spanish political scientist who taught for many years at Yale University and who in the 1970s wrote a book about the breakdown of democratic regimes. And, and summarizing his basic points, he, he says that to be a party that's or a politician committed to democracy, you have to do three things. First of all, you have to accept the results of elections, win or lose. Second, you must unambiguously reject the use of political violence in gaining power or to hold on and holding on to power. 
And then third, you must break completely with violent or anti-democratic forces who break those first two rules. Now, the first two principles are pretty straightforward, but I want to spend a minute on that third principle because it's a little bit more complicated. Now, what's important to remember, as Linz taught us, is that openly authoritarian figures can't kill democracies on their own. They need mainstream accomplices, or what Linz himself called semi-loyalists. Semi-loyalists are regular politicians. They put on suits and work inside the Congress building. They're not the ones attacking the Congress building. Their semi-loyalty only manifests itself when authoritarian threats emerge within their own political or ideological camp. When faced with anti-democratic extremists, Linz argued that loyal Democrats have to do a couple of things. First of all, they have to unambiguously and publicly condemn anti-democratic behavior. This is what mainstream politicians need to do. Second, they need to expel anti-democratic extremists from their own ranks and sever ties with these groups. And third, they must join forces with, the, with their political rivals, with their partisan rivals, people they disagree with on many things, but who agree on a basic democratic rules to, to keep these authoritarian forces out of the democratic process. That's what, some, that's what de politicians committed to democracy have to do, according to Linz. Semi-loyalists do none of these things. Rather than publicly repudiate anti-democratic behavior on their flank, they usually downplay this behavior, justify it, or remain silent about it. Rather than expelling anti-democratic forces, semi-loyalists tolerate, accommodate, and sometimes even protect uh, anti-democratic extremists. And crucially, semi-loyalists refuse to work with their partisan allies against anti-democratic forces, even when democracy is on the line. Now, semi-loyal behavior sometimes seems kind of benign, but it poses a clear threat to democracy because it legitimates, emboldens, and empowers anti-democratic forces. One lesson that's very clear from the democratic breakdowns in Europe in the 1920s and 30s, Latin America in the 1960s and 70s, it's when mainstream parties of the center left or the center right tolerate and enable violent or anti-democratic extremists. It's, it's in that situation when democracy gets into trouble. So turning back to the United States, the US and, the, and uh, Trump's refusal to accept the election results back in 2021 this was, this was a, a clear problem for democracy. But equally as worrying was the fact that most Republican leaders tolerated, even continued to abet election denialism. The fact that Republican leaders decided not to impeach Trump or convict Trump in the Senate after the impeachment or the creation of a bipartisan commission to investigate this, these events, and the fact that nearly all Republican leaders today say they will support Trump when he's candidate in 2024. From our perspective as scholars of democracy in other places and times, this sort of behavior is worrying and it demonstrates a party that's not fully committed to democracy along the lines that Juan Linz argued. Now I want to be clear, in case you think it's unrealistic to expect more of our political leaders, it didn't have to be this way. Compare the American experience to what happened uh, in Brazil in the last couple of years. For several years now, politics in the United States and Brazil have been uncannily parallel. Like the US, in 2018, Brazil elected a right-wing leader, Jair Bolsonaro, who openly admired Trump, and has been called by journalists the Trump of the tropics. Both Trump and Bolsonaro proved to be unusually inept politicians. This meant that both presidents were not particularly popular, which made re-election difficult. And so both presidents lost their re-election bids. Neither Trump nor Bolsonaro were willing to lose. So like Trump, Bolsonaro worked hard to try to undermine the legitimacy of the 2022 elections, baselessly claiming that there was fraud. He even sought out military support to overturn the election, and when that failed, his supporters stormed all three branches of government on January 8th, 2023. So this is uh, Brazil's January 6th. And both the United States and Brazil elected president's unwillingness to accept election results triggered a crisis. But that's really where the stories diverge. Because whereas Donald Trump remained in, remains an imminent threat in the United States today, in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro has been politically marginalized, and the democratic crisis seems to have subsided. A key difference between the two countries, why America remains at the precipice and Brazil not, is the behavior of mainstream politicians in Brazil. In the US, Republican leaders have been overwhelmingly semi-loyal, as I've defined it. In contrast to the US, Bolsonaro, all of leading, uh, Bolsonaro's leading right-wing allies publicly and unambiguously recognized Lula's victory uh, shortly after that. The president of Congress, the governors of the biggest states, and leading right-wing cabinet ministers. Uh, 
And it appears that a major reason why Bolsonaro did not attempt to overturn the election is the political and military elite wouldn't go along with this. And leading figures in the Brazilian right have also forcefully denounced the January 8th attack. And then finally, whereas Republicans have blocked congressional efforts to investigate Trump, what has happened in the, in the January 6th attacks, right-wing politicians in Brazil led the push for a congressional investigation. And whereas uh, Republican leaders will back Trump's presidency in 2024, in Brazil, the courts have barred Bolsonaro from running at all. So not only is Bolsonaro barred from running, he's also been politically marginalized. So the point here is that mainstream political behavior matters. Democratic loyalty can help protect the democracy. Democratic semi-loyalty can get a democracy into trouble. Now, I should say that it's actually pretty unusual for a mainstream political party that's compete, been competing in elections for, for centuries, in fact, uh, for more than a century, to abandon that stance. And so in researching our book, in fact, we found it quite hard to find other political parties who've engaged in basic democratic elections for a long time to abandon that stance. One example that we discuss in the book actually comes from America's own history, uh, the Democratic Party in the 19th century after the U.S. Civil War in the U.S. South. So in this era of Reconstruction, you know, before this period, the Democratic Party had engaged in competitive elections, not fully democratic elections, but in competitive elections through the course of the 19th century. But after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction era, the Southern Democratic Party began to engage in massive election fraud and tolerated violence against African-American voters. Now, there are some interesting parallels here, because although uh, the Republican Party uh, is, is not followed the same extreme path as the Southern Democrats, I think there's some commonalities in driving this. Now, what's, what's, what's happened to the contemporary Republican Party? A lot of factors at work. It's a complicated story. Economic inequality, people have talked about the role of social media and new technologies, all of this matters. But I think one factor that further exacerbates the situation with the American Republican Party today is the role of status loss and perceptions of existential threat as America has moved to becoming a multi ethnic, multi racial democracy. Political parties are more likely to accept defeat when the electoral stakes are relatively low when parties and constituents are confident that losing an election will not bring ruinous consequences. Parties are more likely to turn against democracy when they or their constituents view defeat as an existential threat. In other words, it's an outsized fear of losing that leads parties to turn against democracy. This, we argue in our book, is what led the Southern Democrats to turn so violently against democracy in the late 19th century. And again, the Republican Party today is, is a case that's not as extreme, but there are parallels to the contemporary transition to multiracial democracy in America. The U.S. is undergoing a transition that really is historically unprecedented, that is also mirrored in many European democracies, and that's a transition to a multi-ethnic democracy in which a long dominant ethnic majority loses not only its majority status, but its dominant status in society. The perception that exists among the core of Trump's voters that the country they grew up in is being taken away from them, that's a powerful sense of existential threat. It's powerful enough to turn people away from democracy. Now, this is a commonality, though, I think, arguably, across West European and American democracies. And indeed, I think the Republicans, what we could call a kind of ethno-nationalist radicalization, would pose less of a threat if the US were like other democracies where electoral majorities actually govern. It's really important to recognize that these radical right forces within the Republican Party in the United States represent only a minority of the American electorate. And it's very similar to what's happening in West European democracies. Roughly 20 to 30% of our electorates in established democracies are supportive of radical right parties. The number is sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower, but it's a near constant. There's a kind of sociological regularity across all of our democracies, Germany, Italy, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United States. So given this similarity in our voter profiles, and given the stability of democracy, relative stability of democracy in Western Europe, the, it's clear the problem is not just America's voters. It's something else. And so we contend in our book that the thing that's exacerbating this is our political institutions. The problem lies in something that many Americans venerate, which is our U.S. Constitution. Now, to be clear, the Constitution is a remarkable document. It should be admired and defended. But there are certain features of the U.S. Constitution that amplify the political power of political minorities. And when that political minority is authoritarian, this can be dangerous. 
Now, at the time that it was written, the Constitution was a revolutionary document, uh, influenced the Swiss Constitution, of course. It was crafted, though, in a pre-democratic era. It was designed in part to protect against the tyranny of the majority. But it has generated the opposite problem. More so than any other democracy on earth, electoral majorities often cannot win power, and when they win power, they often cannot govern. Now, we tend to think of these counter-majoritarian institutions as essential to democracy, and I firmly believe that many of them are. Modern democracy requires the protection of minority rights. Not everything should be up for grab in, in elections. The U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, back in the 1940s, used this wonderful phrase in a decision in which he said, some domains must be placed beyond the reach of majorities. And so one of the things we try to do in our book is to specify where and what things should be beyond the reach of majorities. The first is certainly civil rights, civil liberties. Civil liberties like the right to vote, free speech, freedom of association and assembly have to be protected from the whims of a temporary majority. Really critical. The second is the democratic process itself. Elected governments shouldn't be able to use parliamentary or popular majorities, temporary majorities, to entrench themselves in power. For example, by changing the rules of the game to make it so that the opposition can't compete or can never win. This is the classic problem of majority tyranny. This is the problem that we saw in Chavez's Venezuela. This is the problem that we see in Orban's Hungary. And I think this is what we saw signs of in Israel before October 7th with Netanyahu's judicial reforms. So we need certain things, to, certain mechanisms in place to protect a political system from majorities. That's why we have a Bill of Rights in the United States. That's why we have an independent judiciary in some of the institutions of the checks and balances. Civil liberties and fair competition are essential minority rights. But here's the problem. Not all counter-majoritarian institutions are necessary for democracy. So just as some domains of political life need to be beyond the reach of majorities, I think it's not too much to say that in order to be a democracy, certain domains of our political life have to be within the reach of majorities. So I'll mention two. One is elections. If you're going to have a first-past-the-post electoral system like the United States has, majoritarian electoral system where one side wins and the other side loses, then those with the most votes should prevail over those with fewer votes. It's really hard in determining who holds political office. It's really hard to have a theory of liberal democracy that justifies any other outcome. Put differently, office holding should reflect how people vote. The second domain that should be within the reach of majorities is legislation. Those parties who win elections should be able to actually govern. Partisan minorities shouldn't be able to permanently veto legislation backed by parliamentary majorities, provided that the legislation doesn't violate basic minority rights. Institutions that prevent electoral majorities from winning or parliamentary majorities from governing are not essential to democracy. Arguably, they're antithetical to democracy. Now, the U.S., when we look at the U.S. and compare it to other countries around the world, even compared to Switzerland, uh, has an unusual number of these kinds of counter-majoritarian institutions. The Electoral College allows losers of the popular vote to win the presidency. A severely malapportioned Senate provides equal representation to all states, regardless of population, like the Swiss Senate. The Senate filibuster, which allows a partisan minority to permanently block legislation backed by a majority. First past the post-electoral system that inflates the power of majorities and sometimes even manufactures majorities outright and a powerful Supreme Court with extensive review powers and lifetime tenure for justices, which allows justices appointed in one generation to thwart the will of majorities today. Now, each of these institutions on their own may be okay, but when you add them up, the United States is a total outlier. Many of these institutions we might think were designed by the founders to, you know, in the far-sighted plan to, to protect majority tyranny. Some of them were, but some of them were not. Most of them were the result of compromise and improvisation of the founders, who really didn't know what they were doing. I mean, this is in the 18th century. They had no model to, to work on. And so in a, in a very hot summer where they wanted the meeting to come to an end, they agreed to a lot of these things as a way of getting, to, to getting some kind of deal. The concessions and the compromises that were built into this system were necessary for the founding, but they also uh, built in biases in favor of small states which over the course of the 19th century and the 20th century became biases in favor of rural states, underpopulated states. This rural bias has always been there. But it never seriously advantaged one political party over another because for most of our history, both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, had urban and rural wings. 
It's only in the 21st century where Democrats have become predominantly the party of, of urban areas, densely populated areas, and Republicans have become the party of mostly sparsely populated areas. So this rural bias has then turned into a partisan bias in which the Republicans are advantaged in the Electoral College, even more so in the Senate, and because the president picks, nominates uh, justices and the Senate confirms them, also uh, the Supreme Court. And all of this means that it's possible increasingly for the Republican Party to win national power without actually winning popular majorities. This is an increasingly democratically unfair system, inherently. Just consider the, the presidency. So Democrats have won the popular vote for the presidency seven out of the last eight elections. Seven out of the last eight elections. Republicans have won the popular vote only once since 1988, in 2004. But Republicans have held the presidency for half the time. The same is true in the U.S. Senate. So the way the Senate is run, it's, a sta it's elected to staggered uh, six-year terms with a third of the chamber being elected every two years. So it means it takes three elections or a full six-year cycle to fully renovate the Senate. Democrats have won the overall popular vote in every six-year cycle since 2000. Eight Republicans have controlled the Senate for nearly half this period. And then finally, the Supreme Court, three of the current nine Supreme Court justices were nominated by a president who lost the popular vote and were confirmed by a Senate that represented less than half the population. Now, it's really difficult to justify this imbalance with any theory of democracy. All of this has two big effects, one on the left, one on the right, that I think are pernicious. On the left, this is resulting in declining political legitimacy. The po political system is beginning to feel like a system of minority rule to many voters. Policy preferences, as we heard in the last panel about abortion, about gun control, about economic policy, are increasingly out of sync with public policy. Overwhelming majorities of Americans want gun control, are supportive of pretty liberal views on abortion, support more aggressive policies to deal with poverty and inequality. Our public policies don't reflect that. Now, there's many reasons why there's this disjuncture. I mean, there's a lot of people who've worked on these questions, organization of interest groups and so on, but our institutions that don't reflect the will of majorities contribute to this problem. A second consequence is for the right, for Republicans. Our unusually counter-majoritarian institutions have a feedback effect, we contend, on the Republican Party. These institutions reinforce Republican extremism by shielding the Republican Party at the national level from competitive pressure. You know, I think of democracy as being at heart about competition. And this is very, this is important, I think, because in some ways, the, the market, the democracy is supposed to lo work like a marketplace. You know, in the market, when products don't sell, firms lose money. When firms lose money, they come under pressure to fire their managers and come up with better policies, better products. Likewise, in democracies, parties are supposed to win elections. When parties repeatedly lose elections, they're supposed to adapt and broaden their appeal. This is what happened to the British Labour Party after many years in the electoral wilderness and the new face of Tony Blair. This is what happened to the Democratic Party after many years in the wilderness in the 1980s in the, in the person of uh, Bill Clinton. The process of adaptation isn't happening in the Republican Party. Republicans have repeatedly underperformed in presidential races and midterm races. But so far, there's been no serious effort to rethink or to moderate its strategy. This is in part because our institutions are giving a crutch to the Republican Party. We call this constitutional protectionism. Republicans don't actually have to win national majorities. They can win 47 or 48 percent of the vote in the presidential elections and win power. So extremism doesn't cost the Republican Party as it would in a freely uh, functioning competitive marketplace. If Republicans actually had to win national majorities to wield power, they'd face much greater pressure to reign in their extremism. This, at the end of the day, is the, in this way our institutions are reinforcing the democratic crisis in the United States. So my last point today uh, is going to be this, that minority rule is really a distinctly American problem. And no other democracy can partisan minorities thwart electoral majorities as consistently and as consequentially. So why is this the case? Well, you know, excessive counter-majoritarian institutions used to be widespread across the world. The U.S. used to not be such an outlier. Of course, in 19th century Europe, there were all sorts of undemocratic institutions. Monarchical vetoes, indirect elections, aristocratic upper chambers, badly malapportioned legislative bodies, filibuster-like mechanisms to block legislation. But over the course of the 19th, in particular the 20th century, 
Most democracies have gradually shed these institutions. Britain uh, weakened its House of Lords at the beginning of the 20th century. Denmark, Sweden, New Zealand, Portugal got rid of their upper chambers altogether. Germany, Austria, Belgium democratized their senates by making them more proportional to population. Switzerland did not, I guess. Um, Britain, Canada, Australia, France, and other countries established cloture rules to allow simple legislative majorities to pass things through legislatures. Germany and France imposed term limits on uh, national justices. Uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Sweden established retirement ages for justices. And every other presidential democracy on earth got rid of their electoral college. Argentina was the last other country in 1994. So other democracies have become more democratic over the last century, eliminating 18th and 19th century institutions that allow minorities to thwart majorities. The US has not done the same. So today, the United States is the only presidential democracy on earth with an electoral college. We have the most malapportioned Senate in the world except for Argentina and Brazil. No other democracy allows a congressional minority to, and every piece of legislation, routinely veto legislation backed by the majority, and the U.S. is the only established democracy with truly lifetime appointments for justices. Every other democracy has either term limits or retirement ages. So the United States is an outlier. It's a counter-majoritarian outlier, outlier, and I think this is in part what explains why the U.S. has uniquely faced these challenges of democratic backsliding among its peer countries. So what do we do? What are the uh, broader implications of this. Um, it's at this point when I'm talking to American audiences where they really are slumping in their chairs, so I have to end with a kind of positive message. But I think there actually is things that can be done. Because by diagnosing these problems, this points to some cures. And I'm a really a believer in a, a, a wonderful line from the early 20th century American reformer, Jane Addams, who said, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. Americans need to do the work of democratizing their democracy through institutional reforms that make it easier for electoral majorities to govern. Now, again, I understand the importance of protecting minority rights. I'm not advocating for a majoritarianism a la Viktor Orban or Netanyahu. I mean, there needs to checks and balances are a powerful set of institutions, but there are some institutional reforms which often are regarded as radical, again, compared to the last session, maybe not so much, and also compared to what actually already exists in most of Western Europe, they don't seem particularly radical. But things include, we have a 15 proposal in our last chapter, 15 different reforms. Include, I won't go through all of them, but uh, some of the highlights include entrenching voting rights uh, and assuring equal access to the ballot, making it an automatic voter registration, which doesn't exist in the United States, making it easier to vote on, making election day a holiday or be able to vote on Sundays, which doesn't exist in the United States, introducing forms of proportional representation, experimenting with this at the state level, Replacing the Electoral College with direct presidential elections. Democratizing the Senate by at least weakening the filibuster. And establishing term limits for justices. Now, in order for uh, autocratic forces to be defeated, they usually need to be defeated at the ballot box. But each national election in the United States will continue to feel like a national emergency, where everything is at stake, unless we begin the long-term project of reforming our democracy. Now, what does all of this uh, teach us about Europe, problems, sources of resilience? Well, first, in America, as in Western Europe, electorates are broadly divided between a very broad coalition that ranges from the left to the center right, a cosmopolitan coalition, facing off against a much smaller coalition, narrow co ethno-nationalist coalition. Sometimes the ethno-nationalist coalition is more dangerous for democracy, other times less so, but that's a major kind of divide in all of our electorates. Now, there's some good news in this, because in all of our democracies, the cosmopolitan coalition are consistently majorities. Our electorates are overwhelmingly committed to liberal values, democratic values. So that's the good news. But there is some bad news, because there are two ways in which this big majority coalition can be thwarted. As in the U.S., it's possible for our institutions to sometimes give this ethno-nationalist minority an artificial boost, give them outsized influence on our politics. Think not only of the United States, as I've just described it, think of Viktor Orban's uh, base, which, given the nature of the electoral institutions, he has supermajority powers, although his party doesn't necessarily win supermajorities at the ballot box. Think of the first-past-the-post system that has repeatedly given the pro-Brexit British Tory parties around 30-something percent of the vote, but uh, keys to the government. So our institutions sometimes inflate these forces, and then these forces can claim to speak on behalf of the people, which is a myth most of the time. 
So that's one vulnerability. But there's also a second vulnerability that I'm particularly worried about now, and that is that a second way our democracies can get into trouble, and that is if the cos broad cosmopolitan coalition allow themselves to be fractured in the face of serious threats to democracy. I mean, the nature of a broad democratic coalition is very diverse, very heterogeneous, so it's hard to hold it together. And so it's very easy to divide this coalition. You know, debates over immigration can do this, debates over race can do this, and as we've seen in the last month, debates over foreign policy can do this as well. In the U.S. today, there is a risk that the Biden coalition fractures over the Israel-Hamas war. I look at the unfolding debate with a real sense of foreboding. This foreign policy crisis is the perfect, potentially the perfect wedge issue to split the pro-democratic coalition in the United States. Left critics of Biden decry his embrace of Israel, but if he were to abandon this, then right critics would criticize him as well. So he's, he's been in a bind. Either way, there's a real concern that key elements of the Biden coalition don't turn up at the ballot box in November 2024, or vote for one of the small third parties that are running. Either way, again, because pro-democratic coalitions are diverse, they're vulnerable, and they can fracture. This is how Viktor Orban got into power, and I fear this is how Donald Trump could come back to power. So facing democratic threats across the West, it's key that pro-democratic forces need to remember the stakes of the, the, the political contest. Coalitions are necessary uh, to preserve democracy and to expand democracy. It's hard work to keep these democratic coalitions together in the face of setbacks and unexpected crises, including foreign policy crises. But I think here of the 1950s, 1960s uh, song that was inspired the civil rights movement um, in which the key line is, you have to keep your eye on the prize. You have to keep your eye on the prize. You have to understand the nature of the threat. Um, and if you do this, then we realize that democracy is at stake. Thank you.